So I'd like to start out by saying happy Thanksgiving to each one of you. I trust that you, we heard a little bit about people being thankful for having family around, and I trust that everybody had a good Thanksgiving, even if it looked a little different than somebody else's. Uh, but I, Thanksgiving is a really good time, and so I'm, I'm excited for that. It's one of my favorite times of the year. You get colors like that outside, uh, usually this time of year. Um, I'm wearing this today. Was People gave me a hard enough time at Lamar's funeral that I decided to wear this, but it's too hot. <laughs> anyway, so last week we, were, we had kind of a, a message with the Thanksgiving flair. It was, uh, we looked at famous people. We looked at a guy by the name of Herod who was taking the praise that he should have been giving God. And we looked at three different ways that we could give God glory. The first was to accept Jesus as your Savior. The most awesome, the most glorious thing, the most praiseworthy thing that we could possibly do that would make Jesus the most excited would be to ask Him to be our Savior. The second thing we looked at was to announce what God has done. Uh, you know, when we were in our Sunday school class, we did a little bit of, of this. Uh, we did Thursday was Thanksgiving, and I'm thankful for. And we went through the whole alphabet, and then the kids who are coming up with these corny answers had to say why they were thankful for these, for these different things. But we're announcing what it was that we're thankful for. And number three was to act on what God's Word says. By our actions, uh, even by whether we eat or drink, we have the option and the opportunity to give God glory. And today we want to continue that with a Thanksgiving message called Attitude of Gratitude. Uh, in the bulletin, there is a word search. The last couple of weeks, those were pretty popular. On the back, uh, we found uh, a way to make... Uh, a word search with the words that are going to be in the sermon. So kids, if you find this is really boring, or adults, you say, I needed something to keep me awake, uh, or something during the week to remind you of what we talked about, uh, attitude of gratitude word search uh, in your bulletin. We're going to be in Psalms 100. It's scripture reading that was read today, and it's something that uh, we've read lots of times uh, as a scripture reading or a call to worship. And I'd like to read that for you before we look in to see what does this have to do with us. Psalms 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. It says, Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name, for the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, God, for the psalm that was written that reminds us, God, of how great you are, that reminds us of the importance and the, the, uh, the blessing we have to tell you thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. It reminds us, God, of, of how there's blessings everywhere, and if we just are looking for them, we will find them to tell you thank you. I just pray, God, for you to give me your words to say uh, that would make this clear and obvious and stick with each of us throughout this week. I just pray the Holy Spirit works in a special way. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if, if I was to ask you, who is the most thankful person that you know? You don't have to say it out loud, but who comes to mind as the most thankful person that you know? Does anybody come to mind as the most thankful person that you know? You know, um, some people seem to be like Pollyanna. You know, they come out of the shoot looking on the positive side of life. They, they come out always thankful, always grateful for what they get, right? Maybe you know somebody like that. But the majority of us and people like me have to be taught to say thank you. You know, one of the first things that you do with a little kid when, when they start to grow up and they're cute and they're running around and they can barely talk and you give them a gift or grandma gives them a gift, what do we do with our little child? We teach them to say thank you. Right? They have no idea what that means. They just know I was given this gift and I'm supposed to say these words. But if from a young age, we start to teach our kids to say thank you. And hopefully by the time they get to be our kids' age or my age, we, we say thank you because we really mean it. Because we're very grateful for what God has done or for what somebody has given us. You know, of all the people in all the world, rich or poor, black or white, tall or skinny, whatever, whatever opposites that you can come up with, of all the people in all the world who should be the most grateful, it should be us. We as Christians should be the most grateful people of anybody who is on the face of the earth today. 
we should have an attitude of gratitude. We should be looking for opportunities to tell God thank you. So today we're going, we're going to be looking at that very thing about having an attitude of gratitude. Now an attitude of gratitude is obviously it's something that we've heard before. It's not like something I just, wow, I made up, but I think we all understand what it means. It's looking for those things in life to be grateful for. Uh, in Sunday school, I asked the kids, how many of you went to bed last night in a safe, warm house, but then you woke up in a safe, warm house? Every one of them, except for Tristan, I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> Right? Everybody woke up in a house that was warm and heated. And, but how many of us, including myself, said, thank you, God, for keeping my house safe last night while I was sleeping? There are so many things, if we are even, if we're just looking for the everyday life that we can tell God thank you for. It's an attitude of looking for those opportunities and saying thank you. So we're going to be looking at a couple things to be thankful for from Psalms 100. The first thing, verse, four, verse 3, is that we can, are thankful that we are God's people. It says, Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His, and not we ourselves. We are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. So first of all, we can be thankful that we're alive. We can be thankful that God made us just the way we are. It wasn't a big bang that went off billions of years ago that created life. It wasn't just a natural effect of a male and a female coming together, and this happens to be the offspring. You know that life is only there because God gave you that life, right? I think that's pretty obvious. Not we ourselves, right? We didn't create ourselves. If I had the ability to create myself, which I don't, I wouldn't look quite like this. You know, I thought, what, what, would, what would I look like if I could take and add parts and pieces to my body? I would add about four inches. So I, whatever makes me six foot four, okay? I mean, four and a half inches. I would have hair in my head, and I would not have a beard. I just have sideburns, okay? That's what I would look like. I would have bigger muscles, and I'd play the guitar. Like, naturally, I'd be able to play music. But God didn't create me like that, right? I'm not six foot four. There's no hair. I can't play music. And the muscles are there, but you just can't see them. God did not make me like that. But yet God made me the way he wanted me to be. He, he made you with the hips that you have. He made you with the height that you have, the, the musical abilities, the mental abilities that you have. And you have something that you can tell God, thank you for making you the way you are. And everybody has something to tell God, thank you, about the way that they're made. He says, we can, we can thank God because we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now, this doesn't mean every single person is a part of God's family. You know, people want to say we're all God's children. In a sense, you could say that we're all God's creation, so we all somehow fit into that. But we don't just become part of God's family just because we are human. That doesn't make us part of God's family. It involves that trust in Jesus for, your, for salvation. If you're trusting Him as your Savior, you become part of God's family. You become a sheep of His pasture. In John chapter 10, verses 27 to 29, this kind of develops out as a little bit more clear. Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. Now the person who wants to claim that they're a child of God, who has not put their faith in Jesus technically has eternal life because they have eternity. But they don't have eternal life with Jesus. They have eternity in hell, away from everybody and everything, in torment forever. And that's why Jesus came, was to give us eternal life. And we shall never perish. Nothing can snatch us out of God's hands once we become part of his family. Now, does that mean everything in life is good? Does that mean everything in life is perfect? That everything turns out the way that we want it to just because we're part of God's family? No. You know, an example in the Bible is a guy by the name of Job. He was a guy who had everything seemed to be going perfectly for him. He had his wife. He had kids. He had land. He had animals. He had everything he could probably want. And Satan went before God, and, and Satan tells God, you know, if you afflict Job and you take away all these things, he's going to reject you. And, and so God lets Satan take away his kids and his, his, light, his animals and all the things that he owns. And then ultimately, God allows uh, Satan to pick on Job's physical body. He just couldn't kill him. And he looks something like this with all these boils and all these terrible things all over his body. But what does Job say through all that? He says, though he slay me, 
yet will I hope in him. It doesn't matter what God is going through or allowing me to go through in life. I'm not going to give up on God. I'm going to keep trusting God in spite of all of this. So just because you're a child of God doesn't mean everything's going to work out hunky-dory the way that you want it to. We also know in Romans 8, 28 and 29 that once you become a, a part of God's family, whatever you're going through in life, God is using that to make you like Jesus. And that's going to be different. It's going to require something different, of, a different life experience for me than for you to make you more like Jesus. Because we're all at different ages and stages of life. But we know that and we can have confidence that when things are going bad, God's doing it for my good. And his goal is to make me like Jesus. So not everything is going to be good, but we know that God is good and he's going to do good, something good through that. God's goodness, number th part three, or number is, okay, so the first reason we have to be thankful for is that we are God's people, right? We can all, if we put our faith in Jesus, we are his children. But number two is that God's goodness is there for all generations. It says, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generation. Right? Anybody can get up here and do that, right? You can write that out and say, hey, this is a reason why God is good. Why, why, why we are, should have this attitude of gratitude is because God is good. He is loving. He is faithful through all generations. The Bible reminds us of this several times of God's goodness. It says in Psalms 107, verses 8 and 9, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. And his wonderful works for the children of men. He satisfies the, long, the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. God is good. All the time, God is good. You know, think about what God could have, could, what it could be like. You know, God, first of all, he's good all the time. He doesn't wait like a lot of kids do. You know, Christmas is coming. What happens the last week of Christmas? All of a sudden, mom and dad, how can I help you? All of a sudden, brothers and sisters are going to get along because Christmas is coming. I want my presents, right? God doesn't wait until the week before Christmas to start saying, I'm going to be a good God. You know, think about how much fun God could have if he really wanted to be not a good God. He could say, you know what? I'm going to make a half human, half monkey. I'm going to make a half, a half fish, half antelope, right? He can make all these sorts of, he could give me two noses and one ear right there if he wanted to and just laugh at, look at creation. But God is good, so he doesn't do things like that. We can give God thanks and praise because his goodness is there for all generation. God is merciful. It says in Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's, every day, he starts afresh with new mercies. He doesn't say, I'm sick of you doing this before, and I'm going to carry this in through the next day. You know, you guys know the, uh, the verse about don't go, like when you're in a fight, especially with your spouse. Don't go to bed angry because what happens the next day is you, <laughs> you just pick up where you left off, right? I've experienced that, you know, and it just keeps going. Well, God's mercies doesn't, his frustration doesn't get carried in day after day. If you, if you ask for forgiveness, he will, he will move on and he has fresh mercies for you because God is merciful. In Psalms 103 verse 10, just a couple pages over. It says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. I am a sinner. I'm a first class or a last class sinner who doesn't deserve anything. Because of what I've done, I don't deserve this life that I live. I don't deserve to be up here. I don't deserve to have a family that loves me, have money in my bank account. I don't deserve the air that I breathe. I don't deserve anything. I deserve to be stuck in hell forever barely gasping for air and as much pain and punishment as could possibly be but because i put my faith in jesus i don't have to worry about that and right now he's not treating me the way that my sins deserve to be treated because god is merciful and that mercy is new every morning number three is that god keeps his word it says uh, let me um if i if i look at here it says um 
we're, he says his faithfulness continues through all generation in verse 5. His faithfulness, he keeps his word. Whatever he says he's going to do, he's going to do. In Numbers 23, 19, God is completely different from a human. If you look at this description, you probably have been there. You probably know people who, who are men, who do lie, who change their mind, who say they're going to do one thing and they do something else. They promise it, but they don't really do it. But God's not a man. He doesn't lie. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't speak and then decide not to do it. He promises and he fulfills it. And there's hope and there's confidence in there. You know, one of the worst things about, about people is that we know that we can change your mind. And if I know somebody says they're going to do something and they don't do it, how frustrating is that? It's unreliable. It's, it's, it's irritating. But I know if God says he's going to do something, I can take it to the bank. I can be confident that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. One of those things that he says he's going to do, Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You, you can guarantee anybody that if they put their faith in Jesus, he's going to save them. He's not going to say, well, I'll think about it. I'm going to see if Josh improves his life first. He, it's, it's a guarantee. It's a promise. You put your trust in Jesus for salvation, you are going to have eternal life. God is not going to lie. He's not going to change his mind. He's going to give you that salvation. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. From eternity past, when God started creating the world, guess what he did? Day one, he, he finished the day and he says, it is good. Day two, day three, everything that God made was good. Throughout the whole Bible, you find instances of where God is good. It didn't just start today. It wasn't just then. All from history past to the present we're living in, God is good. And to the future, God is going to continue to be good as long as life endures. God's going to be merciful. He was a long time ago. He is today, I guarantee you, and he will be until the end of time. God kept his word back in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Today, God is still keeping his word, and God will continue to keep his word. And that is an awesome reason to have this attitude of gratitude, to be willing to say, thank you, God, that you are merciful. Thank you that you are good, because he doesn't have to be. And thank you that you are a God who keeps his word. Lots and lots of major reasons to give God thanks. So first of all, we should have an attitude of gratitude. The second thing is that our attitude of gratitude, we can look and see that it should be demonstrated in two different ways. We should have this attitude of gratitude. We should live this attitude of gratitude. It should be a part of our mornings, a part of our walk to school, a part of our evening meal, part of before I go to bed, all throughout my day, I should have this attitude of gratitude because there is no end, no limit of the good things that God did in our life that we should be telling him thankful, being thankful for. We, we, share, we show our attitude of gratitude by the words that we say. It says in verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. And this is something that should be happening everywhere. We should have this attitude of gratitude. We should be opening up our mouths and telling God thank you everywhere we're at. Now when we look at this, first we see that outside the place of worship. There should be an attitude of gratitude. There should be using our words to tell God thank you outside the place of worship. It says, as you enter his gates with thanksgiving. You know, you, they, they would have a, a wall and they would have gates as you'd actually walk through in order to get into the place of worship. Now, we don't have that, right? We don't have walls surrounding our building. You can just walk in from the street. You can walk very easily. And so we don't have that. But the picture you have there is that you, you're walking through this threshold, coming into the place of worship to give thanks. Now, is that the only place they were supposed to worship or, or give God thanks was as I crossed the threshold, all of a sudden I just pick it up and I start telling God thank you? No. That meant that everywhere they were outside the place of worship, they should be telling God thank you for something. Thank you for my, for my wife. Thank you for keeping us safe. Thank you for the harvest. Thank you for the, that we were able to catch that last calf that's running around, right? That's what they should be outside the place of worship telling God thank you. And the same for us. Outside this building, and as everywhere else, right, we should have this attitude of gratitude. We should be in that position of telling God thank you for a number of things, for anything 
You're out on the hunt and you see the beautiful creation. Yeah, I missed that deer or I didn't see any deer, but I see this beautiful creation. I can say, thank you, God, for the beautiful day that I got to see. You know, when you're in the school gym, when, you're, when, you're, when your kids are playing basketball, you know, thank you that my kid is healthy and able to be out there playing. Thank you that they made that shot. Uh, when you're, when you're uh, at your company, right? When you're with your job, whatever part of your, that you have a job, right? Every basic things, and we can just go on after, um, example after an example of where we should be telling God, thank you for things outside these walls. It's just a matter of if we're going to do it. So that's what this, the author of this psalm is saying, is outside the, the place of worship, you should be telling God, thank you. Right? We all understand that. And then he's saying, inside the place of worship, we should be telling God, thank you, because he says, and enter his courts with praise. Once you got through those walls, once you got through the gate, that they had this big opening, which was where they worshiped God. They didn't go actually into a temple to worship God, but they had this great big opening surrounding the temple, and that was the place they were supposed to be giving thanks and praise to God. And so we take from that, within the walls of our church, we should be giving thanks and praise to God. So this is where I'm going to get my microphone and walk around. Just kidding. But we should, within the walls of this church, be giving God thanks. You know, during the praise time, when, we have, when you say, hey, thank you, God, for Brent, that you did this in his life. When you're talking to each other, you're like, I'm not telling everybody, but in a conversation like I had with Darren saying, with, with, my, with the improvement of my brother, right? Telling, giving God thanks. When you're sitting here not talking to anybody, there are things in this room we can thank God for. I can thank God that you guys are all here today. I can thank God that uh, we, have, we have music. We have a piano player. I can thank God that we have the paint on the walls. I can just thank God that, uh, for the week that I had. Right? Just sit here and contemplate and say, thank you, God. So outside these church walls, we should be giving God thanks. Inside these church walls, we should be giving God thanks as well. Everywhere we're at, we should have this attitude of gratitude. We should be looking for, what can I thank God for now? What's next? What can I thank God for, for what comes after that? So we, we, have this, we give God thanks by the words that we say, and we give God thanks by the actions that we display. Because in Psalms 100, verse 2, mine says, worship the Lord with gladness. In the King James, it says, serve the Lord with gladness. By the things that you do, you can give God thanks. You can give God worship. You can give God praise. You know, when they're, when they're out working in their fields, they can have an attitude of gratitude. They can give God praise by doing their job well. Uh, when they're raising their kids in their home, when they're, when they're on their way to the temple, the guys who are in the temple doing all the sacrifices, right? They can be giving God praise by their actions. Not even saying a word, but they can be giving God praise by their actions. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 to 24, it says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart is working for the Lord, not for men. For, at the end of verse four, or 24, it says, It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Whatever you're doing, you do it for the Lord. It's actually human really serving. Yes, I get on that school bus tomorrow morning, you know, after sleeping in for five days, and I'm driving that bus as an opportunity to give God glory. I'm just driving a bus. I don't even like it. I don't like school. I don't like nothing about it. But it's my opportunity to give God glory by driving a bus. If, you're, uh, if you have a particular, uh, a certain part of your job that you hate, you can have that grumbly, I hate this attitude, rah, 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 like me in the bus. Or you can do it with the right attitude and give God glory. That class, kids, that you don't like at school, right? You all know what that is, or maybe it's all of the classes. You can listen to your teacher, you can do your assignment well, and you can give God glory. Whatever you're doing, do it as if God was the teacher. I'm going to do it as if God was on the bus with me, right? Whatever it is, do it as if he was doing for the Lord. Whatever you're doing is an opportunity to give God glory. We looked at last week, even something as simple as whether you eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. You can do every little thing that you're doing to praise God, to bring myself glory. Uh, but I would encourage you, encourage myself, hey, do this for the Lord and not for men. It doesn't matter if man sees this. It doesn't matter if they say, wow, good job and thank you for whatever. God sees it and it says that he will reward you. 
Now, when I think about outside the building and I think about in church here, you know, I hope that when you have a ministry in this church, you don't feel like, great, I got to do this again. You know, and I will admit I've been there too, sometimes on a Wednesday night, except for this year, it's been like the best year of my career of, of a one. I just have loved it every single night. But there's been nights where I come and it's like, great, I can't wait till this is over, right? I'm, I'm tired of dealing with kids. I'm, I've had a long day. I really don't want to do this. Uh, so I understand that feeling, but hopefully you don't feel like, man, I have to do this. Uh, because it really is a privilege for you to be a part of ministry, for you to serve God in some way or another. I think about being up here. I get up here and I preach on Sundays. It is a privilege for me to be up here. We all know that uh, there's, there's better preachers out there. And I'm not trying to be false modesty. I mean, like David Jeremiah, you know, but, and God himself could come here on a Sunday morning and just blow Jeremiah away, right? And blow me away. But for God, for some funny reason, says, I want to use people. And I want to use Josh, of all people, to get up here and to preach. And so I do. But it's something that I, um, I, I need to look at it as a privilege that I get to do that. Kathy, who plays the piano, is a privilege. The deacon board, who are in that position, it's a privilege. You who teach Sunday school classes, it's a privilege. You who work in Awana, uh, you who uh, decorate the church, right? These are a privileged thing. I hope you don't think, great, I got to do this again, because really it's a privilege to, for us to be able to do that. And we should be doing it joyfully. We should be happy. And if, if you don't, if you can't find the happiness to do it, I want to encourage you to, to slow down and back up on life a little bit and think of where, where, where should your life be right now? Where should it be headed, right? Without Jesus, my life should be heading to hell. But because Jesus loved me and he forgave me, he gave me the greatest gift Nothing else should compare, nothing else and that should keep me from wanting to do what God asked me to do because of what he gave me. Anything I can do is just a thankful. Thank you that I don't, I'm not going to hell. Thank you that I have salvation. Thank you that I have hope. And do it with that kind of attitude. I hope it's not anything like, great, I got to do this again. Because we really have a good God who really has loved us and, and done more for us than we can ever think of or imagine. You know, the air that we breathe. All day, every day, I'm breathing. I'm not telling God, thank you for the last 43 years of life. Thank you for all the air that I breathed. Thank you, God, that I was able to walk for the last 43 years of my life. Thank you that I was, you know, I, we just take so many things for granted. We thank you, uh, we take for granted that these walls are, or the ceilings still holding, right? Or that the pews are, are holding us. And so there's so many things that we could just stop and just spend time telling God, thank you. I know you know, having an attitude of gratitude is not always an easy thing to do because we don't think about the things that we have to be grateful for. Things don't always work out the way that we want them to. Yes, we have stories like Brett who came through his surgery and it was a miracle and everything's exciting, but we've already mentioned that there's loved ones that have passed on. People that we wanted to have for one more Thanksgiving, for one more Christmas. We prayed just as hard for them as we did for Brett and God didn't see fit to do that. So I know sometimes it's hard to have this attitude of gratitude because we don't always get what we want, right? But sometimes we do get everything that we want, and it's still hard to have an attitude of gratitude because we just, we just get excited about what happened. We just take for granted that we have these things that we don't spend the time to turn around and say, okay, God, thank you that you did get me safe from point A to point B. Thank you that I didn't hit that deer, right? Thank you that I was able to get through my day. We, we, just, we just take it as just expected. So sometimes it's hard, even when life is good, to have this attitude of gratitude. Today we're reminded that we have all people, of all the people on the earth, have the one thing that should make us the most thankful, and that's Jesus. Because Jesus, nothing compares to Jesus. The, the, the game-winning shot doesn't compare to Jesus. The job doesn't compare to Jesus. The car, the money, nothing that we have compares to Jesus. Jesus is eternal. His love, His faithfulness, His goodness is from eternity past to eternity future. We need to have an attitude of gratitude that shows up by the words that we say, but also by the actions that we display. So I just want to encourage you. I just want to say, let's leave today different. 
a little bit more thankful, a little bit more uh, determined to make sure that our lives reflect that attitude of gratitude because we do have a God that's worthy of praise and worthy of thanks. Let's, let's, let's overwhelm God today, right? With how, how many thanks and, and great uh, praises that we can give Him. And let's carry it throughout the week and let God know how much He means to us because He really deserves all the praise and thanks that we can give Him. So, let's pray. Father God in heaven, I know just from my own life, God, if, I, if it's just you and me here right now, God, that there's so many things that you have done in my life that I have not told you thank you for because I, I didn't recognize it as more than just something that happens all the time. God, I know that the major things in life, the, the healing of a sur through surgery, the, um, the job, the, the safe travels, God, some of those things that are a little bit bigger deal, I can tell you thankful, thank you for. But I know that there's so much more that you do that I don't even give you the praise and thanks that you deserve. And so I'm sorry for that. Just please open my mind. Help me, God, to think about all the many ways that you are amazing in my life. I pray for each one of us, God, that we would just, just be a little bit more keen, a little bit more open to recognizing uh, the good things that you do for us in life. You are such a good God, and we, should, we could spend all day, every day, just thanking you for that. And um, So thank you for being my God. Thank you for being my Savior and for giving me eternal life. I just pray that you bless the rest of our, our day, and thank you for being who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.